He also had the opportunity to meet with uh, our partners there uh, who are working for debt repatriation, um, who have been concerned with the reality that the debt there and the international financial institutions have continued to do a lot to prop up an illegitimate government. Uh, Tom uh, will share some of his perceptions uh, with us um, and would like as much as possible to have an honest conversation with us. So there'll be a time to ask questions of Tom that he'll moderate. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, announce that uh, many uh, of those of us who are wondering about some of the political questions about Tom's uh, future involvement in politics, at least in the short term, uh, was answered this morning uh, as he just accepted to take the lead as president and CEO of the Center of American Progress, C4, their action arm and advocacy arm. So without further ado, uh, I invite Tom Cariello, a friend of Jubilee, and a friend of um, the work that many of us have been involved in. Thank you, uh, Eric, and everyone at Jubilee. I'm on the tail end of a poll. My pediatrician sister assures me that I'm safe to be around, uh, but my voice is a little raspier uh, than it would normally be, so I apologize for that. Um, I'm excited for this to be a conversation, and many of you have, I'm sure, experience in Egypt and the region and with questions of debt relief. And the interesting thing about the conversation is in some ways the question of debt relief is the only thing that uh, most Egyptians seem able to agree on. Um, it is an incredibly contentious uh, time in Egypt and a very exciting ways and in certain moments in scary ways. Um, but for the most part, um, it is a transition that we all know will take some time and we don't know where it will end. Um, but everybody knows that the economic situation in Egypt is very tense. There is a revenue shortfall. Uh, that comes from a combination of factors, including obviously the loss of tourism, the loss of foreign direct investment, um, but also a, a, a closing up of a lot of economic activity in the country and in the region where much, many families send money back into Egypt from working around the region, so a number of factors that, that play into that. Um, and regardless of where one comes down on the ideological spectrum or how one feels about the election results that just were, uh, there's almost no way to think about uh, the fact that an, that this transition happening in the context of an economic crisis with huge debt hanging over Egypt makes it worse and reduces the possibility of uh, a really smooth transition happening. So, you know, I want to circle back to some of these questions of, of debt, some of the people who've talked about whether it should be conditioned to debt relief or other things. Um, but I can say that, that there is actually some sense among Egyptians that I've talked to, uh, both those in power, uh, those in you know, public positions, as well as those in the streets, uh, that there is a strong sense that the debt is quite crippling, uh, that relief of the debt would be something that's accepted, uh, while there is widespread concern about um, uh, meddling and, and intervention from abroad, whether that's from the Gulf states or from the US or elsewhere, uh, relieving debt that was uh, rung up under past regimes is something that I, I think, again, we will find a few outliers there, but for the most part, that is something that people see as a positive thing. Again, the question of conditionalities is, is another question. The issue of repatriating uh, debt, I can tell you, is also something that is wildly popular uh, among those people, the idea of finding the billions that people believe are out there. I can tell you from another personal experience of mine that, that I wouldn't hold your breath on this. Um, while the effort is one that I think is symbolic and shows uh, an important sense of solidarity with people who feel like their nation's resources have been stolen by a small few, uh, in many cases uh, people perceive it as being the Mubarak family itself primarily, um, and wanting that money back. The reality is it's extremely difficult to do. I was involved in the prosecution against Charles Taylor, uh, the dictator of Liberia, and there was a lot of hope that the money that he had been able to get out of blood diamonds and timber resources, and not to mention World Bank and other things, uh, that we were going to be able to find uh, this money. In fact, we were eager to not just find the money, but create a criminal precedent um, on the connection between the financing of some of these war crimes and the resource uh, gap. We had some of the best investigators from Canada, from Switzerland, from people who worked in the Rwanda tribunals, uh, et cetera. And um, you know, we, we were ultimately not very successful. I mean, we were able to find little bits here and there, little leads here and there, um, 
but there are a variety of reasons that was difficult. Now, a lot of that was happening uh, in that case in a just after 9-11 context. I think there have been some rule changes that made the ability to, to look at transnational financial flows, uh, including into some of the banks and some of the, say, shadier or, or let's take a different spin on it, uh, more private uh, nation states in which some of these things occur. So we've got a few conversations. We have the overall debt um, factor um, that in terms of relief of that debt, we have the specific issue about uh, illegitimate money uh, overseas that could be somehow brought back. Um, and then you have other funding mechanisms that are economic development money, support for the military, et cetera, which isn't directly in the purview of this conversation we'll get to. So let me just take you back to my experience a few weeks ago and then some of the experiences through the years, just to put in context um, what continues to be a very dynamic environment. Uh, so I got there, I think it was the Tuesday before the elections, um, and went out into Tahrir, where I, I, this is my sixth trip into Egypt since uh, this all began. Um, went to just interview some folks uh, at the square, which I've done often, and as you know, some of the people there um, from who had me visit them before. Um, and you know, within a couple of hours, I got hit twice by some pretty wicked tear gas. Um, and I wasn't right there getting hit. Um, there was just massive amounts of it being used, and it was hitting me, and it was really nasty stuff. And everyone was pointing out to me that it was made in Jamestown, Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> and, and that was shown to me quite frequently. But, but it, all, it felt, more than any of the other times that I've been in, it really felt almost like a street war. And it, was, it was only within about three blocks. It was basically Mohammed Mahmoud Street. It was this one street, and there were people coming out bloody, and there was a lot of tear gas being used, and you would go three blocks away, and people were shopping. Um, and so there was a lot of imagery that, I mean, it wasn't imagery in a false sense, it was very real um, when you're in it, and then you would step just a little bit away, or you'd go across the river, and you would feel like you were in a very different place. And there was a sense also in which previous, during previous trips when things were going on in the square elsewhere, even if you were in a different town or in a different neighborhood, all the screens were on local Egyptian stations. This time, about half the screens were on football matches, not our football, obviously soccer matches. Um, and so there was some, again, sense of this disconnect, but also a very real um, a violent uh, struggle in the square. Then, a day later, uh, a friend of mine, um, not a close friend, but someone I know, Jahan Dijem, who's a filmmaker who made the, uh, directed the movie Control Room about Al Jazeera, um, was filming in the square, got arrested and detained, um, and they uh, had just, there had just been the detention of a reporter um, uh, and commentator, um, uh, Monel Zahawi, who I don't really know very well. Um, then with John, about four hours in, the police reported that they no longer knew where she was. Um, and then she was spotted on a bus being brought to Torah, which ends up that they were just bringing her there and then sort of turning around. So it was either a confusion or a mind game. Um, and it took about 48 hours to get her out of prison even uh, with uh, obviously a lot of calls being made. So there's this context again, it's just sort of feeling like what the heck is going on. And then about 48 hours later, witnessing what are probably some of the most smooth and functional first elections that I've seen in uh, countries that I've observed them. So here you have, again, in a transition where you have in this sort of revolutionary context, this ongoing sense that there are these very deep clashes going on about where sovereignty is going to rest, where legitimacy lies, what the role of the military is going to be. And then you also have this sense in which the nation is saying, hey, we're ready to have elections, we can have elections, um, we're ready to go vote. And obviously uh, it's been pretty well reported that that vote was overwhelmingly for uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and secondarily, many, for the most part secondarily, for the North Party or Salafist Party. I'll come back to that. So in looking at this and going back through kind of my experiences through the year, um, uh, my first of which was uh, trying to go in. Uh, I happened to be working in, in Doha in the Darfur peace talks when the 18 days the original revolution began. And so I flew in to try to see what was going on and got, that didn't work very well. I got detained and interrogated at the airport for 12 hours and kicked out of the country. So I didn't get all the way in that time, but I did get my experience with the Egyptian security forces, or, or, or apparatus at that point. Um, and uh, then in subsequent trips coming in, including most of the month of July when there was something called 
at the time it was mostly called the Second Revolution, which got pretty much zero press here, but was a very big deal in the context of Egypt. Most things had not gotten press here until the Mesmero incident, in which um, uh, it was largely a protest driven by the Coptic community and some of the liberals that were uh, fighting for Christian rights, and then the, the recent round of violent protests right before the election. The election. So there had been sort of this dead space, uh, of course. So if you look back over all these periods, and I can bore you with sort of as many of my observations are, as are of interest from these various snapshot moments, um, you really have at least three different conversations going on. One is the one that gets the most attention here, which is the sort of secularist to Islamist axis. Um, I would argue that that has actually been much less of the conversation that I've heard in Egypt, not, not, not that that's not a topic, it's certainly been a topic, it remains a topic, um, but that's in many ways how the Western media will continue to filter the conversation, is, is that sovereignty axis. The other sovereignty axis is really the democracy versus military axis how much sovereignty will ultimately lay with the people and the political process versus the military, with that range being sort of complete and unaccountable and opaque military control at one end of, an, of, of that imagined spectrum and the other being you know, uh, total civilian sovereignty over the military, transparency, et cetera, down here. Um, and you know, within that axis, and the, the third axis, by the way, is, is in this, and that axis is getting a lot of attention, a lot of conversation. The third axis um, it was imagined to be about sort of jobs in the economy, which is a big issue. Um, but ultimately, it was very difficult to distinguish any of the political parties that emerged as having particularly distinct economic platforms. Um, everyone talked about justice or social justice um, as having sort of faith-based roots. Um, and agree with that. Uh, people seem to endorse, you know, to varying degrees, some model of the free market, um, but both rejecting sort of what we would think of as a true laissez-faire capitalism and rejecting sort of a socialism state-based economy, having more or less something in the middle. People would put out platforms. There wasn't just a lot of discussion that I saw uh, about it. People would agree on things like we need tourism, we want to attract foreign direct investment, you know, general things like that. But there wasn't, I didn't sense a whole lot of people, and, and to be honest, let's face it, we don't see a lot of that here either. It's not like when I was running for office, people were like, can we go through your seven point plan for jobs that I know you wrote up on page 37, I see that uh, your infrastructure plan uses this pricing structure, and I, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's more, it tends to be a little more of a mythos, mythos level of debate. But what did, in my mind, um, and again, I'm an amateur observer of this, become more of the question on that economic axis was competence. Um, who could credibly deliver services? And I think this is a place where I would argue perceptions of the Muslim Brotherhood and a lot of the support that ended up falling uh, in the direction of the Muslim Brotherhood had less to do with, uh, and again, this is conjecture, uh, less to do with people feeling like they wanted to back them as an Islamist party and less uh, that people, you know, pointed out this sort of bribe idea. Well, they went out and gave people free medical services and free education, and therefore people vote for them, it's sort of a vote buying thing. Now, again, noting I'm not Egyptian, I, I, I am an outside observer. What I heard more of in talking to people, and I did over a thousand interviews over the summer, up and down the Nile, not just in Cairo, but around, and then did Fairmount this last time, was the idea that these people could could conduct the delivery of services competently and in a way that did not seem corrupt. Um, if you look at the polling numbers for the Brotherhood, they remained extremely low right up until the end. There was a huge block of voters who um, were undecided. As a bit of a you know, Politico person myself, um, when I see most elections here, you might have five, 10, maybe 15% of voters who are truly undecided, right? Most people pretty much know where they are. In this election, depending on the poll you looked at, like 70% of voters were on the side. There was a sense of wanting to reject the old NDP structure, but there was a lot of skepticism initially in particular about the Brotherhood as a political force. People had spent decades hearing about how this, you know, hearing very bad things about them through state media uh, and elsewhere. And people, uh, I think, have a very deep sense of sovereignty within Egypt. 
uh, and therefore a group that is seen as having, you know, or you know, being told for a long time that this is you know, money coming from outside and comes from outside, uh, was skeptical. The Brotherhood went out and, and made the case on that. And it really was quite phenomenal to watch uh, as someone who has conducted elections, run for office myself, um, the get out the vote effort by uh, the Brotherhood and in many shocking ways by the Salafists who were new to politics altogether. Um, you know, I was in a polling booth for, I spent like half an hour at one in Alexandria. I spent the first day of voting in Cairo and the second day in Alexandria. I was in a voting booth and this was in a fairly liberal neighborhood. Like when I talked to the Brotherhood people, they didn't actually expect to win this precinct. But there were two tables, uh, one of Brotherhood women, one of Brotherhood men. Each had about six people and three laptops at the table. There was no one from any liberal party present um, at all. There were two Salafist guys in the corner who I talked to who said they weren't even from that district, but they had been asked to come out, so they were there. Um, and there was this, there was just this unbelievable presence. Now, there were also factors where um, people had been told, and it was technically in the law, that you could get fined 500 pounds, which is about $100, a little less than $100, a lot of money. Uh, for not voting. Now, this had always been on the books. The, the amount had gone up because they finally adjusted it for inflation. It has not tended to be enforced, as I understand it. But it meant that a lot of people were showing up who not only had been an undecided voter three weeks out from the election, but even that day were undecided voters. Um, and they were going in, you know, because they didn't want to get fined. Um, now, I happen to think, you know, universal voting in whatever form is a good thing in a society, so I like the spirit behind this. Um, but what I would see over and over again at the polling station was that people didn't know if they were at the right polling station. They had their, their national ID, but not necessarily their voter ID. And they'd go to the police officer at the door, and he would say, I don't know, and send them to where? To the Brotherhood table. <laughs> because they had the laptops out, and they had all the voting rolls and everything else, and they would go over regardless of what political persuasion they were. And the Brotherhood folks would say, oh, yes, we'll look that up for you. Here, let me write out your polling station, your polling number. Um, and by the way, I'm writing this on a piece of paper that has the FJP slate uh, over here right next to it. Now, you know, for how many people does that uh, actually affect their vote versus saying, thank you, have a nice day? Depends on, um, you know, whether one believes that this was, you know, 5% of people who had made up their mind or 30% of people who had made up their mind. So there are so many factors that remain um, uh, in play in terms of what the overall political there's also something that's interesting about the fact that the Brotherhood did so well. And, and you know, I was meeting with some of the Egyptian pundits, the equivalent you know, of our kind of talking heads on, uh, on the news. And I was getting ranges from you know, the day on election eve from, you know, I think the Islamists will win. Only one person went as high as 65 or 70 percent. Um, and uh, that was actually shoddy. I mean, almost everyone else was like, well, we think 50%. But I had people still swearing that the Brotherhood would not get more than 15%, you know, on election eve. So, you know, this is how new this was. This was how uncertain things were uh, in terms of that election context. But now, in some ways, you have an interesting split. And I'm going to shut up in a second so this can be more back and forth. Which is up until... In July, let me go back a step and then forward a step, back a step. In July, the revolutionaries basically made a decision to ignore the elections. And, um, you know, I talked to a lot of them at the time, and they said the elections in Egypt will be the end of democracy, not the beginning of democracy. Uh, they didn't believe that the underlying shift away from power basically resting with the military and with a small group of elites. Um, they felt like whoever was going to get elected on this short of a timeline from whatever party was going to be co-opted and corrupted into that system um, and would have then the validation of a democratic election as opposed to before where they could at least resist it under the idea that it was a repressive regime. And therefore the goal was maximum resistance before elections in order to demand as many deep reforms um, and real reforms as possible before that because after that the thing would skew in a different direction. Um, the Brotherhood, of course, made a different decision, which was it's all about the elections, and they made that decision largely from the day after Mubarak fell. And both sides kind of got what they wanted. Um, you saw just in that same week that I described, the revolution was continuing right up until the elections. There were dead bodies in Tahrir um, being dragged around. There were people being tear-gassed massively. There were 
you know, it was, it felt very much like the protest continues in the street, and they were continuing to hold the line in ways that ironically uh, ended up helping the Brotherhood even more on this idea of, uh, against military sovereignty for popular sovereignty. And many have said to me over and over again, we would rather support the, you know, illiberal democracy, basically, um, the Brotherhood that we don't like, we consider illiberal, but democratically elected over a more liberal leaning military. What's gonna be interesting as we go forward is whether they mean that. Because the fight is no longer between the protesters and the military. Um, going forward, it seems likely that the real power struggle is gonna be between the Brotherhood and the military. Um, we have now um, a period from now until the presidential elections, which are currently set for June or July, um, in which the military has said they are going to retain military control until the president is elected. It's unclear what they are planning to hand over even once the president is elected. There's large sense that they will maintain sovereignty over, is it just military affairs? Is it anything the military touches, which includes, by some estimates, up to 35 or 40 percent of the economy? Um, is it the budget, et cetera? Within this, you have a real ideological you, this could go one of two ways. It could be a very nasty fight because the military and the Brotherhood want different things. There's the issue of core sovereignty, one side wanting military sovereignty, the other side wanting either democratic sovereignty because they think they keep winning or Islamist sovereignty, depending on what one believes. That also translates into what one thinks about the parliament, right? Because the Brotherhood wants a very strong parliament and a weak presidency. The military wants a strong presidency and a weak parliament. Um, the parliament is something that the Brotherhood believes they will be able to, to win on a regular basis, but they also believe that any time power gets concentrated in one individual, it's going to be very likely the military will be able to control who that individual is. That individual will then build sort of a new NDP style uh, structure throughout. The, um, so, so the question was, and I was asked this a lot in a couple of days after the election, people who were absolutely swearing to me, had been swearing to me for six months, uh, that the military and the Brotherhood were in cahoots, that this had all been a deal cut behind the scenes between the military and the Brotherhood, were all of a sudden telling me, while well, we now see that these two groups hate each other and they're gonna be fighting. I was like, well, but you said they were in cahoots. They were like, I never said that. Anyway, that's okay. Um, the issue um, is not definite. We don't know whether that fight will happen. Most, both of these are seen as very transactional, pragmatic actors. Not feels that way, I'm just reporting kind of what I hear, that could actually get some agreement. Is it something where the Brotherhood could be okay with getting, you know, the cultural ministries, the education ministry, and the health ministry? Health has a huge amount of patronage in it and direct contact with voters, education, uh, culture, for obvious reasons, and the military agrees on other things and they kind of deal. Or is this, is this a real coming clash? And then the revolutionaries and the reformists, to the extent that they're still relevant after this electoral um, crushing, I'm just going to use a less pleasant term, um, you know, which way will they come down? Because the ones who had been swearing to me they would back a brotherhood's right to govern, even if they disagree with them, weren't feeling quite as confident about that position once it looked like these guys were going to be able to dictate a lot of terms. Now, let me just close this full circle by saying some of this is going to relate to not the question of debt relief itself, I don't believe, because I think as a policy matter, almost everyone agrees under any scenario that's a good thing. The question is, people are going to say, how much do we want to exert leverage through these various things? And folks who are feeling more like we want to um, put in our lot with the military in order to protect against, say, an Islamist uh, power base would say, well, whatever we do, don't condition the military aid because we want that, you know, that's the relationship we want to protect. If we're going to do anything, why don't we condition the day and say, okay, that is going to depend on whether it's protection of, you know, religious minorities or of women or of basic human rights and rights of assembly. Uh, others who uh, worry more about this idea of democracy versus military autocracy would say, and look at the tear gas and other things, would say, well, why don't we condition the military aid um, to the military and, you know, let's get the debt relief aid out there no matter what. From, I think, the Jubilee perspective, my guess, and I won't speak for you, is, you know, you, you would want to look at debt relief on its own terms and not as a leverage chip uh, 
uh, in these other ways. But I think those are some of the ways that people a few blocks away from here uh, may think of this playing out. Um, and so, you know, given how uncertain this all remains, where will Egypt be uh, two months from now? Will, you know, the military has already signaled that it's not going to take this parliament very seriously. Uh, one of the concerns people have is if this all, after six rounds of voting, because the vote for parliament is actually going to take six separate elections, um, then we get a parliament that doesn't even seem to have real power. Uh, where does that get us? So, and then other factors, obviously, in the region. So, you know, I think what we see here is a situation where uh, we can agree that getting basic economic relief in any form into countries that are hurting is uh, generally uh, going to make sense in this case. Conditioning is going to be incredibly complicated and can backfire even uh, on, on its own terms sometimes. Um, and also that this is really a story that Egyptians are ultimately going to write. Uh, and that's one of the things that's also struck me throughout this process is as much as you know, we sometimes talk about or fret about how much the U.S. does or doesn't determine this, that, the other thing. I think ultimately from the 18 days that I went through Mubarak to this recent election cycle, the reality is that Egyptians are making these decisions. Um, and it's not always about whether they make the decisions that we would want or agree with. Um, and it's about that process and believing, uh, as many do, that ultimately allowing people to define their own future has to mean people are taking responsibility for those actions and by doing so moves us into a better direction. But, um, but that's an easier thing to say for one who is not, say, a Christian woman living in, you know, a Salafist neighborhood in, in Cairo, or not well, Alexander, wherever. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm curious to hear people's own observations, their questions, their concerns um, uh, on this, and again, offer whatever thoughts and observations that I can. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a question that probably is as much, or even maybe even totally directed to the Jubilee staff as much as to you, but it's on a question that you, of course, raised since we're here at Jubilee. Um, at the beginning and the end, you talked a little bit about Egyptian death. And so I was wondering if folk can tell us a little bit about um, the magnitude of that death, um, the proportion of it that's owed to the international financial institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, etc., and um, whether post-Egyptian spring and, you know, since things have, since Mubarak was overthrown, have these institutions been making loans to Egypt? So where do we stand on all that? I can answer. I don't. Did, uh, when you talked to Phil, did he give you any? He did. Yeah, <coughs> well, ahead. one of the big things right, right now with the the debt in Egypt um, is there's a, a strong call and need for an audit. So there's a reality that, unfortunately, like with Zimbabwe and many other countries and partners that we work with, we don't know what the full amount uh, of the debt is. Um, in terms of you know our main jubilee partners